All right, welcome back to Reasoned Answers. A little while ago, I had on a guest named MK. We looked at the Islamic teachings of jihad. We kind of took this deep dive where we really went through a lot of sources. I'm pleased to say that he is back today and we're going to be looking at the subject of child marriage. We're going to be asking this question. What does Islam teach about marriage? Does it allow marriage at any age, for example? Or is there certain criteria required before one can get married? We're going to be attempting to not just give our opinions, but rather go to the primary sources, go to Islam's greatest scholars, go to the teachers of Islam. We want to see what the classical scholars say, because if anyone understands Islam, I would think that it would be well-educated Muslims closely connected to the time and the culture where the Quran was revealed. Welcome back to the channel, MK. Why don't you go ahead and take a minute or two to introduce yourself? Thank you for having me back on. I've decided to research a couple of subjects that is pretty controversial regarding Islam. And I just wanted to see, okay, what do the Muslims themselves say? Because my opinion, it is not relevant. I just want to portray what the Muslim scholars themselves have said on the topic of child marriage. And as we did on the topic of jihad, we are going to start with the basics first. In the second chapter of the Quran, it says that a divorced woman must wait up to three menstrual cycles before another marriage. And in the 33rd chapter, it says, when you marry the believing woman and then divorce them before you touch them, then there is not for you any waiting period to count concerning them. In other words, the waiting period of three menstrual cycles are only for those women who had intercourse in their marriage. So if a woman has a waiting period, it means she had intercourse with her husband. Ibn Qudama said the following, If a man leaves his wife before touching her, then there is no waiting period for her by scholarly consensus. Similarly, Ibn Kafir wrote, this is a command on which the scholars are unanimously agreed that if a woman is divorced before the marriage is consummated, she does not have to observe the waiting period and she may go and get married immediately to whoever she wishes. This created a problem for the Muslims at the time, because how do you determine the waiting period of three menstrual cycles for those women who do not menstruate? This is where the 65th chapter of the Quran comes into play. And as for those of your women who have despaired of menstruation, if you have a doubt, their prescribed time shall be three months. And of those two who have not had their courses. And as for the pregnant woman, their prescribed time is that they lay down their burden. So this verse prescribes the waiting period for those women who have had their marriages consummated and makes mention of three categories of women. It is those who have reached menopause, those who haven't menstruated, and those who are pregnant. The plain reading of the text is clearly referring to prepubescent girls in the second category, but in modern times, people have tried to ignore this and come up with different interpretations. The historical context can be found in Ashab al nazul Ubay ibn Kaab said, O Messenger of Allah, some women of Medina are saying, there are other women who have not been mentioned. He asked him, who are they? He said, the young and old and the pregnant. And so this verse, Quran 65.4, was revealed. So the historical context is clear. The second category is referring to the young. But what does this Arabic word for young mean? The Arabic English language lexicon is clear. It is applied to a human being, a child, i.e. one who has not yet attained puberty. An encyclopedia of Fiqh also says this. Idiomatically speaking, it, the term young, is a description that applies to a human being from the day he was born until he reaches puberty. And a 2013 fatwa also says, it is unlawful for a girl that has reached puberty, according to Islamic law, which is indicated by menstruation or any other physical sign, to be called young. For on it, a girl reaching puberty, the Islamic rulings related to marriage are applicable. There is no dispute among the scholars in that a girl that has reached puberty is not young in this ruling. 
So any Arabic speaker who knows the Sharia and has a good knowledge about the Arabic language and the original meaning of words will know this. Only those who are ignorant, I'm sorry to say, would try to deny the fact that the term young is about prepubescent goals. You can open almost any of the tafsirs and you will see that this verse is in reference to the young, i.e. prepubescent goals. Before you jump into the tafsirs, I just wanted to highlight that if you're talking about category of people who are very old, the logical flip of that would be those who are very young. Likewise, if you're talking about people who have stopped menstruating, the flip of that would be people who have not yet started menstruating. So the most natural reading, even without looking at any tafsir, is that it's talking about old women who have stopped menstruating and young women or young girls, more accurately, who have not yet started menstruating. So even before we look at what the Muslims said, our assumption is that that would be the best reading of the text. So if they also agree, then that's pretty decisive, I would say. There's no room for reinterpretation. Exactly, exactly. So let me show you three tafsirs that do this, just to show you that I am speaking the truth, but there are many others. Al-Tabri said, Ubay ibn Qab said, O messenger of Allah, some women are not mentioned in the book, the young girls, the elderly, and the pregnant woman, thus Allah revealed this verse. He said, the same applies to the waiting period for girls who do not menstruate because they are too young, if their husbands divorce them after consummating the marriage with them. Abu Mansur al said, it is proven that what is meant is, if you have a doubt in the waiting period of the menopausal and the young. Abu Bakr al Yasar said, he, Allah, ruled that the divorce of the young girl who does not menstruate is valid, and divorce cannot occur except in a valid marriage. So the verse gives permissibility of marrying off a prepubescent girl. So this is just three tafsirs. I have found roughly 40 tafsirs and scholars who have said and reported exactly the same thing. If you want something from the 11th century, I can show you it. If you want something from the 15th century or the 16th or the 21st century, I can show you that as well. This is how the Muslims have understood this verse in literally every single century. Let's end this section with two last quotes on Quran 65.4 to summarize this all. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani said, and those who have not menstruated yet, he made the waiting period three months for those who haven't hit puberty yet which indicates that giving her into marriage before puberty is permissible. Muhammad al-Bukhari said, by his words and those who have not menstruated yet, so he made the waiting period of a girl before puberty three months. How do westernized Muslims respond to this verse? Before you get to the response, I just want to say that this is crystal clear here. You got 40 sources, 40 well-respected Muslim sources, all saying the same thing, plus the logic of the verse. And one of the tapsters you cited says that Muhammad revealed this, or, or Allah gave it to Muhammad, specifically in response to a question about women who had never menstruated because they were too young. When we look at the modern attempts to redefine it, we got to keep this in mind, how clear it was to the ancient Muslims. Exactly, exactly. So the first objection modernist Muslims bring up is that Quran 65.4 is referring to those who have a medical condition of some sort. But having looked at the tafsirs, it is abundantly clear that the scholars have consistently understood the verse to be regulating the waiting period with invalid marriages of prepubescent girls who have had their marriages consummated. Therefore, anyone who denies that the verse is in reference to prepubescent girls literally contradicts the historical background wherein the verse was revealed to Muhammad, as well as 14 centuries of scholarship, including Sharia law manuals. However, the claim that the verse could also include those with medical conditions, it is not entirely without merit. Abdul Qadir al Jilani said, and those who have not menstruated yet, due to young age or sickness. So it is both. The primary meaning, as we saw in the historical context wherein the verse was revealed, as well as all of the tafsirs and Muslim scholars responsible for the books of fiqh, understood the verse to be about preoccupation goals. However, some of them did point out that the verse does have room for it to include those who have reached puberty potentially, 
but did not menstruate because of an illness or some other reason. So when westernized Muslims try to say that the verse is referring to those with medical conditions, then okay, yeah, sure, you could add that as a secondary meaning, but the primary meaning, as we have already seen, is prepubescent girls. Now we can move on to the second objection, and it is that the Arabic word Nisa, woman, in Quran 65.4 can only be used in reference to adult women, not prepubescent girls. This claim is immediately disproven by simply rewinding the video and seeing how the Muslim scholars, tafsirs, and books of fiqh have interpreted the verse to be about prepubescent girls. So it is clear that the term can be used in reference to prepubescent girls, and even the Quran itself testifies to this. In the second chapter it says, And remember when we did deliver you from Pharaoh's fault, who were afflicting you with a dreadful torment, slaying your sons and sparing your woman. That was a tremendous trial from your Lord. Numerous other passages in the Quran all mention how Pharaoh killed all the newborn sons, but kept their woman, Nisa, alive. And of course, from the Bible in the first chapter in Exodus, specifically verses 15, 16, and 22, those who were kept alive is explicitly called the newborn daughters. And this is actually confirmed by Ibn Kafir. If the woman gave birth to a girl, they would leave her alone and go away. But if she gave birth to a boy, the killers would come in with the sharp knives and kill the child. So the woman in the verse is the newborn baby girl. Yeah, exactly. If the ones being killed are newborn boys, then the ones being left alive, by common sense, have to be newborn girls. And it's using the same word. Therefore, this term seems to just mean female, as opposed to specifying the age of an individual. Exactly. Ibn Atiyah also said, Akari Abu Muhammad said, the correct interpretation is that the sons are the male babies and the women are the female babies. They were called women. So with those two objections out of the way, we can now move on and briefly look at the four schools of jurisprudence in Sunni Islam. The first school we will look at is the Hanafis, named after its founder Abu Hanifa. Muhammad al-Shaibani is considered to be the father of Muslim international law. He is an extremely influential and authoritative jurist for the Hanafis, especially because of the fact that he was a disciple of Abu Hanifa. Al-Shaibani reported the following from Abu Hanifa himself. If the father marries away his minor girl and minor boy, or if the father is deceased and the grandfather marries them away, the marriage is valid and they, the minor girl and boy, do not have the choice of annulment upon reaching puberty. So Abu Hanifa is clear, prepubescent children can be married off. The second school of jurisprudence is the Malikis, named after its founder Malik ibn Anas. Ibn Rushd wrote, as for the prepubescent non-virgin woman, Malik and Abu Hanifa say that the father can force her to marry. And the third school of jurisprudence is the Shafi'is, named after its founder Al-Shafi. Al-Shafi wrote, No one is permitted to give a young girl who has not reached puberty in marriage except for the fathers. And the fourth school of jurisprudence is the Hanbalis, named after its founder Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Ahmad ibn Hanbal's son reported, I heard my father asked about a minor girl whose father gives her in marriage to one man and whose brother gives her in marriage to another. He said, the contract concluded by the father is valid regardless of whether the girl was pleased. The father's contract is considered valid for the minor girl. So all four founders of the four schools of jurisprudence are clear. Prepubescent children can be married off girls and boys. Fadius, I could sit here for the next hour or two hours and show you quotes of countless Muslim scholars, <laughs> jurists, and books of fiqh where child marriage is made permissible. But just to give people an idea of the sheer magnitude of Muslim scholars and the authors of the books of fiqh or Sharia law manuals, which I have tracked down, this is a list of roughly 70 authors who I have found to affirm child marriage. In reality, it is much more than 70 because many of them actually quote and mention what other people have said as well. So the real figure is closer to 100 and this is only what I have personally found. 
there are obviously many others. Most people will actually find it much harder to find a scholar who did not discuss child marriage compared to finding a scholar who did. Look what Al Shafi said back in the 8th century. The father's marrying of the minor children is ancient, and no one disputes the fact that it is permissible. Omar Wazi said, the scholars have a consensus that the father can marry off his prepubescent son and daughter. Ibn al-Mundir said, there is a consensus among the scholars that the father's contract of marriage for his prepubescent virgin daughter is binding if he marries her to an equal. And this is the opinion of Malik, al tabri Al-Layf, al awzi Ubaid, Al-Shafi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ishaq, Abu Ubaid, Abu Tawr, and the people of opinion. And their evidence is the hadith of Aisha, and we hold to the same opinion. Ibn al qatan al-Fasi said, They are unanimously agreed that the father can marry his prepubescent daughter and does not require her permission. Ibn Qudama said, with regard to a virgin who is still a minor, there is no difference of opinion concerning her. Ibn al-Mundir said, every scholar from whom we have learned is unanimously agreed that it is permissible for a man to marry of his virgin daughter who is still a minor, if he marries her to someone who is compatible, and it is permissible for him to marry her off even if she objects and refuses. The fact that it is permissible to give a minor girl in marriage is indicated by the words of Allah, Quran 65.4. Ibn Rushd said, they arrived at the consensus that the father can force a prepubescent virgin to marry. al qurtabi said, if she is a minor, he can marry her off without her consent because she neither has permission nor consent. There is no disagreement. Ibn Ajar al said, Ibn Patal said it is unanimously agreed that the marriage of prepubescent girls is allowed even if she was still in the cradle. But now the question is, has there been anyone in Islamic history who contradicted the consensus of the scholars? As with most things in life, there is always an exception. Ibn Shibruma and Abu Bakr al asim are the only two individuals that I have found in the first 1,000 plus years to have rejected prepubescent child marriages. How did other Muslims respond to this view? Let's we'll pause Bakr. right here for just a second. We have 70 to 100 on the one side, according to your research, and two on the opposition side. So we're talking at least 98% or so of Muslims were in agreement. Yeah, they, the scholars say it was unanimous and it was technically only 98% consensus, but good luck getting 98% of people to agree on just about anything. And this is as strong of consensus as absolutely possible in human thought. Yet the modern Muslim will tell us, oh, you know, that barely anyone supported this. They're just backward people of their time or something. Yeah, exactly. And keep in mind, it's much less than 2% because these are like the notable individuals. That is actually why they stand out. In reality, it's going to be like 0. Point something percent. Ibn Battle said, al Muhalab said, the scholars have unanimously agreed that the father is permitted to give his minor daughter, who is not physically fit for sexual pleasure, in marriage based on the verse, and those who have not menstruated. It is permissible for a girl that has not experienced her menarche, her first period, to be married even from the first day she is born. I suppose by writing this chapter, al-Bukhari wanted to respond to Ibn Shibruma. For al tahawi reports that he, Ibn Shibruma, said, it is not permissible for the fathers to marry off their young daughters. They have the choice to get married or not when they reach puberty. But this is an opinion that none of the jurists have said except for him. Therefore, his anomalous opinion is disregarded for it contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah. In other words, Ibn Shabruma's position is an anomaly and rejected. It contradicts Quran 65.4 and the Hadith of Muhammad marrying Aisha. This is how Muslims responded to Ibn Shabruma's view. Now that it is well established that Islam permits child marriages and intercourse with children, the next question we will look at is, when can a Muslim actually have sex with his prepubescent wife? We have already seen that Quran 65.4 allows husbands to marry and have sex with their prepubescent wives, so this part is not even up for debate. 
If puberty is not a factor in deciding when a husband can have sex with his prepubescent wife, when exactly can a husband have sex with his child bride if it is not based on puberty? Ibn Battle explained the different views. A group of scholars said she, the young girl, consummates her marriage with her husband when she becomes nine years old, following the example of the Hadith of Ahisha. This is the saying of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Abu Ubaid. Abu Hanifa is of the opinion that says, we agree on consummation once nine years of age is attained, except we say that if she has attained nine years of age, but cannot handle intercourse, then her parents are allowed to keep her from her husband. If she has not reached nine years of age and she is able to have intercourse, then they, her parents, cannot keep her from her husband. Malik used to say financial support of the husband is not applicable on the young girl until she is able to have intercourse. Al Shafi says if she is approaching puberty, is bulky, and is able to have sex, her husband is permitted to consummate his marriage with her. If she is unable to have sex, then her parents can keep her from the husband until she is capable of having sex. In other words, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the founder of the Hanbalis, says that you can have sex with your child bride, but only when she is nine years old, and he uses the hadith of Muhammad and Aisha as proof. Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanafis, says that the age doesn't matter as long as she is able to have sex. So the husband can have sex with the kid even before she is nine years old, as long as she is able to handle it. While Malik, the founder of the Malikis, and Al Shafi, the founder of the Shafi'is, also make clear that the prepubescent girl can have sex with her husband. Ibn Maza said, the majority of the scholars are of the opinion that the age factor is not put under consideration. What is considered is the ability to have sexual intercourse. If she was of great size and fat, able to handle sex with men, and it is not feared that she will get harmed by that, her husband is allowed to have sexual intercourse with her, even if she had not yet reached the age of nine. But if she has a thin and slim body and is not able to handle sex, and it is feared that she will get harmed from it, then her husband is not allowed to have sexual intercourse with her, even if she is of a proper age. So the majority view is that the child should be able to handle sex with men. It is about how big and fat she is. Things like this. Age is not relevant. Theoretically, if a prepubescent girl was big enough at the age of six, the husband can have sex with a six-year-old girl. I'll point out that these are physical signs here, that they're looking for the body to be able to handle the physical activity. They're not concerned with anything else. Like we might be in modern times say that it's mentally damaging to a child. That wasn't remotely in view. Exactly, exactly. And Al Nawawi said, with regard to the winning party of a young married girl and consummating the marriage, if the husband and the guardian of the girl agree upon something that will not cause harm to the young girl, then it, the consummation, may be done. If they, the husband and the guardian, disagree, then Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Abu Ubay say that once a girl reaches the age of nine, she can be compelled to eat consummation without her consent. But this does not apply to younger girls. Malik, Al Shafi, and Abu Hanifa said the limit of consummation is to ensure sexual intercourse can be endured, which varies among girls, so no age limit is set. This is the correct view. There is nothing in the Hadith of Aisha that gives any limitation or prohibition of sex for the girl that is capable before the age of nine. So, Al Nawawi is clear as well, the majority and correct opinion, according to him, is that you can have sex with a prepubescent girl before the age of nine if she is capable. Ibn Abidin said, if a husband wishes to consummate the marriage with his prepubescent wife, claiming that she can endure intercourse and her father claims that she cannot endure it, what is the Sharia ruling regarding that? Khaya al ghamli answered this question. If she is plump and rounded and able to endure intercourse with men, and the stipulated immediate measure has been received promptly, the father is compelled to give her to her husband, according to the correct opinion. The Qadi assesses if she is of those who exit the house, then he calls her out and looks to her. If she is fit for men, he orders her father to hand her over to her husband. 
and if she is not, then he does not do so. So the jurors make an explicit distinction between puberty and the girl being physically ready. Her physical attributes are not the same as her being pubescent. Physical appearance is not synonymous with puberty. They are clear that if they judge a girl to be physically big enough to be entered upon, the Muslim can have sex with a prepubescent girl. And Muhammad Allah said, it is possible to have sex with her, meaning the wife. There is no fixed age for when sexual intercourse with the wife is permissible. It depends on the various physical conditions of the girls, in that how fat or slim their bodies are. Attaining puberty is not required. Notice here that the girl isn't part of this equation at all. You have the husband and the father, and they're deciding. And if there's a disagreement between them, they can bring in a third party who is qualified to judge a person sitting in a, in a position as legal judge or whatever. The girl's opinion, totally irrelevant, not in, in view anywhere. Exactly. And that's very sad to see. But now the question is, what do the Muslim scholars say today? Did they change for the better or are they upholding the true Islamic belief? In the 2002 fatwa, they ruled, if this girl in question is incapable of having sexual intercourse because of her young age, then it is not permitted for the husband to engage in intercourse with her, for it will cause her harm. But he, the husband, can fondle, hug, kiss her, and ejaculate between her thighs. In other words, if I have to translate this from Islamic terminology, you cannot rape a kid who isn't ready to have sex, but you can molest them through other means. And similarly, another fatwa said, and if an adult man marries a young prepubescent girl, he is allowed to pleasure himself with her by any means of pleasure that is lawful. As for sexual intercourse, it is not allowed until she is able to handle sex and is not harmed by engaging in it. Now take a look at what it says in the Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence. The jurist view is that one of the reasons that prohibits handing over of a wife to her husband is young age. A young girl that is not able to have sex is not handed over to her husband until she grows up and this barrier is removed. This is because he could get carried away with the lust for sexual intercourse and end up harming her. The Malikis and Shafis are of the opinion that the young age barrier is removed if she is able to handle sex at that young age. The Shafi, he said, if the husband requested that she be entrusted to him with the promise that he will not have sex with her until she is able to, she should not be entrusted to him, even if he is trustworthy, for it is not guaranteed that he will be able to control his sexual desire. What is the saying? The jurists are of the opinion that Muslims might not be able to control their lusts for little children. They believe that there is a real risk that the husband will be overcome by his lust for a little prepubescent girl who cannot have sex yet. Of course, a little prepubescent girl can have sex a bit later on according to them, which is already screwed up, but even way before that, Muslim men have lust and sexual desires for prepubescent little girls that are like five or six years old. This is what happens is when you objectify women and make them sexual objects for men Perversions know no limits. Yeah, this is just really, really disgusting. The, the fact that they're looking at their own men and saying, we can't trust them not to enter that girl who is too young for them to do so without harming her. Forget about her, you know, forget about her desires or, or what she wants. We just can't trust the men to not physically injure someone. They're so consumed by lust. Disgusting. True, exactly. And another 2004 fatwa says, there is nothing harmful with ejaculating between the thighs of a minor girl that is incapable of engaging in intercourse and is harmed by it. That is, if ejaculation is not preceded by penetrative sex. The scholars have indicated that, in principle, it is permissible for the man to enjoy his wife sexually however he wishes, provided he does not cause her harm. They mentioned examples like masturbating using her hand, fondling her and kissing her, etc. And lastly, a 2010 fatwa said, with regards to sexual pleasure, if the girl has attained the ability to endure being with men, 
he is permitted to sexually pleasure himself with her by intercourse or other means even if she doesn't attain puberty. So this covers Sunni Islam. But what about Shia Islam? Ayatollah Khomeini wrote the following. It is not permissible to have sexual intercourse with one's wife before she has reached the nine years of age, be it a permanent or temporary marriage. But there is no problem with all other sexual pleasures such as lustful touching, embracing, kissing and tafris. Fying, it is rubbing your thing against her thighs, even if the wife is still a baby being breastfed. So in Shia Islam, intercourse cannot happen before the age of nine, which agrees with the minority position in Sunni Islam, that of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. However, Ayatollah Khomeini says that it is allowed to sexually pleasure yourself through other means, even if your wife is still a baby. Other people have pointed this statement from Ayatollah Khomeini out before, but what a lot of people have failed to realize is that this is a very commonly held belief in Shia Islam. Another Ayatollah basically said the same thing word for word in the 19th century. And Ayatollah Sayyid, who only died last year, wrote the following. Is enjoyment apart from sexual intercourse permissible, such as looking, lustful touching, embracing, and fine? This is obviously the case, even if she were in infancy, since there is nothing fundamentally wrong with it. So multiple Ayatollahs have affirmed not only child marriage, but also the molestation of babies. I didn't want to end the video talking about the molestation of babies by Muslims, so I kept one last objection for us to go over, just so we can end on a slightly less messed up note. So before we look at that, Farius, do we have comments to add? It's just really hard for me to, to take this information. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. Just go and do it if you want. All that matters is your sexual pleasure. That's the only thing that, that you should be thinking about. It's just utterly depraved and sadly, as you pointed out, very common opinion. And we see this in various ways, not just in these scholars. We see it in news reports uh, of children being molested, survey data. It doesn't enter any official crime statistics because, hey, it's not a crime in, in these countries. But occasionally when outsiders are able to do research, they find that a majority of children have been molested even outside of quote unquote marriage. Yeah, that's very sad. Let's end this on a slightly more neutral note. A lot of times modernist Muslims try to curate an, a counter argument to child marriage by quoting the fourth chapter of the Quran and try orphans as regards their intelligence until they reach the age of marriage. If then you find sound judgment in them, release their property to them, but consume it not wastefully. So the intent of this verse is to ensure that the orphans can be entrusted with their property by testing their abilities and to protect them from making bad decisions. So modernist Muslims point to the words, the age of marriage, and then look at various tafsirs saying that the age of marriage is in reference to puberty. And then the westernized Muslims conclude that people can only be married off once they have reached puberty. So it is not hard to see the problem with this reasoning. Take Ibn Kafir for example. Ibn Kafir affirmed that Quran 65.4 is in reference to prepubescent girls having their valid marriages consummated. Are we supposed to believe that when Ibn Kafir wrote in his tafsir that the age of marriage is in reference to puberty, that Ibn Kafir is contradicting himself? Was Ibn Kafir and everyone else that ignorant for 14 centuries where they didn't realize that their interpretation of Quran 65 verse 4 and 4 verse 6 are contradictory? How do we reconcile this? One possible interpretation is that it only restricts prepubescent orphans from being married off, not prepubescent children in general. I discussed this verse in much greater detail in my document, so I recommend people to read that for a better treatment of the subject. But the second possible interpretation is the more likely meaning. The words the age of marriage is referring to the purpose of marriage. In other words, the ability to procreate, which is puberty. This means that the verse isn't placing a literal restriction regarding the age of marriage. Instead, it is referring to puberty, 
by referring to attaining the ability to fulfill the purpose of marriage, which is procreation. So it takes some time to wrap your head around this statement. I'll read this again. It means that the verse isn't placing a literal restriction regarding the age of marriage. Instead, the words the age of marriage is referring to puberty by referring to attaining the ability to procreate. I'll say that again because it took me a while to understand this as well. So the age of marriage, it is referring to puberty, but only indirectly. Its primary meaning is that the age of marriage is referring to the purpose of marriage. And that is procreation, which is puberty. So once you understand the line of reasoning, you'll understand that. And this is a note that we can end the video on. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll put a link to the document so that you can get even more sources and even more details if you so desire. But I believe the case is pretty definitive here. We have 14 centuries of, of Muslims where nearly every single person who ever looked at these verses came to the same conclusion. They came to the conclusion that there is no minimum age to marriage. There is sort of a minimum age to consummating the marriage, but it has nothing to do with puberty, it has nothing to do with the girl's desires or the girl's mental readiness or her maturity or ability to reason or anything along those lines. It just has to deal with how big her body is. If her body is big enough that you won't harm her by climbing on top of her, then you're good to go. And if it's not big enough, no worries. You can still do whatever else you want to her body. You just can't literally enter into her. The modern attempts to redefine this by creatively reinterpreting the Quran are nothing more than bidda, forbidden innovation. If someone wants to be true to historical Islam, true to the message that Muhammad brought, true to what the first three generations of Muslims said to be the best of all Muslims believed, it's quite clear that there is no minimum age for marriage, nor is there a predefined minimum age for consummation. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the Muslim has to get married at, at a young age. Many Muslims, most Muslims, are far superior to their God and Prophet. But the position of their God and Prophet, crystal clear. Go ahead and do whatever you want, if you're a man, that is. If you're a man and you have sexual desires, do whatever you need to fulfill those within the confines of legalized sex, also known as marriage. Any closing thoughts from you? No, you summed it up brilliantly, Farius, and thank you for having me back on. Absolutely. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll have more talks with MK coming up. Until then, have a great day and God bless.